Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caitlin Bloomquist, and I am the Public Relations and Marketing Manager at Greenspring Media, the publisher of Minnesota Monthly and Midwest Home Magazine. Today, I have the honor of moderating this American Heart Association Community Conversation on Mental Health and Well-Being. Um, before we get started, I do want to go over some general housekeeping items. Everyone should already be muted, but if you are not, um, please make sure to mute yourself now. Uh, we also want to make sure everyone turns off their video feature so we can focus on our panelists. You will find that button to turn off your video sharing at the left bottom corner of your screen. Thank you. And a reminder that this is being recorded and we will share a link of the recording via email later along with a link of resources. Today's webinar is also being live closed captioned. And again, feel free to post your questions in the chat box. Um, we will address them at the end of our panel presentation. And we do ask everyone to be respectful with their comments and their questions. Um, and we do reserve the right to remove anyone from this meeting if we deem it necessary. Before I introduce our panelists, we do wanna take a moment to show you a video from the American Heart Association CEO and National Board Chair about the challenges we've seen our city and country contend with the past week. Like you, I am heartbroken by the tragedies that have taken place across our country. The memories of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and far too many others remain with us, and our hearts go out to everyone, everywhere, who is grieving and searching for justice. The American Heart Association denounces senseless acts of racial violence against individuals and unnecessary violence in our communities. As a nonprofit healthcare organization, we are taking a stand on social justice issues because it's the right thing to do and because there is scientific evidence supporting the link between social justice and health equity. Racial disparities in heart disease, stroke, and other chronic conditions exist and are well documented. African Americans are also more likely to be uninsured. There is also scientific evidence that African-Americans physical and mental health is negatively impacted by the inequities that exist. Add this to the fact that in the midst of a global pandemic and given barriers to health that exist, African-Americans and other people of color are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The American Heart Association has championed health equity for all people for nearly a century, and we are more determined than ever to eliminate racial and class disparities. We will redouble our commitment to overcoming barriers to health and to addressing social inequalities. We must stand together as a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. That is our mission, our contribution, to a more equitable society. People are counting on us like never before. We will listen. We will drive change. We will be relentless. Thank you for your support and thank you for listening. There's such powerful and important words for us to hear during a time like, like now, and the American Heart Association is truly an important voice on, on health equity. Now, as we move forward with our webinar today, uh, I think the stress of COVID-19 and quarantining as well as now going back into the world has made us all really focused on the important role that mental health plays in our lives and our overall well-being. Um, so today we are going to explore various angles of this topic, including the impact of COVID-19 on mental health, the connection between mental health and heart health, and the importance of good sleep for overall health and well being, followed by your questions. And we have a special thank you to our local sponsor of today's community conversation, the Mayo Clinic. And again, like we had mentioned, an email with a link to resources will follow this webinar. So now I have the honor of introducing our panelists. Uh, first up, we have Ginny Palin. Ginny is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. Her background includes public health research and analysis, community engagement, 
public policy and community leadership. Janice Allen is the CEO of Range Mental Health Center, a nonprofit community mental health center serving as the essential community provider for North St. Louis County. Janice has certification in EMDR trauma therapy and worked as a clinician treating crisis and trauma survivors. Next, we have Julie Bloom. She is the CEO of Guild, an organization that works at the intersection of mental health, housing, and employment. A social worker by training, Julie is passionate about driving systemic change. Dr. Courtney Jordan Beckler is the medical director of the Emerging Science Center at Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, focusing on the Women's Science Center and the Prevention Center. She is a board certified internist and cardiologist focusing on the prevention of heart disease and behavioral change that supports overall well-being. And last but not least, we have Dr. John Park, um, an associate professor of medicine in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Mayo Clinic. He is a nationally and internationally known expert speaker whose research has focused on obstructive sleep apnea, delirium, and quality and safety improvements. So let's get started. Ginny and her colleagues, Janice and Julie, will discuss the impacts they have seen COVID-19, quarantining, and now reopening the state um, having on mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ginny Palin. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. Um, some folks may be familiar with our group through its acronym, MACMAP. Um, next slide, please. Um, at MACMAP, we are a statewide association of 32 community-based mental health and chemical health programs, um, representing over 200,000 Minnesota families, children, and adults that we are serving across the state. Um, collectively, our members' mission is to serve all who come to us seeking mental and chemical health services, regardless of their insurance status, their ability to pay, or where they live across their country or state. Um, the majority of our folks, as was um, represented in Janice's bio, bio um, the majority of our agencies are essential community providers as, as, as a designation, um, and we are part of the backbone of the mental health safety net in the state. Primarily, um, through our charge, we are serving um, a lot of culturally diverse, low-income, uninsured, or Minnesotans who are on public health care programs who otherwise would not be able to access services across the state. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick representation of where all of our member agencies are across the state of Minnesota and in the seven county metro area. Next slide, please. And our response under these two pandemics is really just to let everyone know that we are here for you as providers. Next, please. Um, we know that you all are going through a lot in the wake of two national and international pandemics both COVID-19 and all of the civil unrest and cries for justice and, and social and racial justice. We want you to know that everything you are feeling is okay and that we are here for you. And for my part, I just want to share some very high level um, resources across all of our community mental health programs. Um, our community mental health and chemical health programs have a site in nearly every county of the state um, serving clients and communities across appro approximately 150 sites. We provide comprehensive service arrays at every different agency across, across the uh, community mental health spectrum. Um, and as was said earlier, we serve all who come to us regardless of insurance, daddy, insurance status or ability to pay. And um, I just want to make a quick note that in the follow-up, we'll we will be providing um, a statewide map with some interactive links to all of the different individual agencies' websites as a resource. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Julie Bloom, the CEO of Guild. Hi, thank you, everyone. We're so excited to be here today. So I'm um, going to be talking just a few minutes about what we're seeing as community mental health providers um, across the state. Um, with the COVID-19 epidemic. I think as Ginny said, um, what seemed to be an epidemic that turned our entire world upside down um, and changed everything that we know, our daily routines, um, how we conduct our life, our responsibilities and our family um, has again been upended by another pandemic of civil unrest and racial justice. Um, and we really see that this time in our history is an, a time for credible change and even some people are saying a revolution. And I would posit that some of those things that these two 
uh, pandemics are probably connected in that um, we've spent so much time over the past few months just i think grappling with our daily routines being changed our individual responsibilities spending so much time with our families perhaps in contemplation or just trying to survive um, and so i think we've had this opportunity in our country to kind of go back to those basics and think about what it is that we all need to do um, just to, to kind of stay healthy in our day to day so we have certainly seen um, I think as a community, just a serious um, uptick in our own mental health and mental well-being um, symptoms. And so for a lot of people, we're seeing greater anxiety. So many of us are, have lots of reasons to be anxious about our health. Um, and the pandemic naturally causes a lot of anxiety for people who've already lived with anxiety or have had health-related anxieties or fears about illnesses. These are just um, I would say expanded a thousand fold. And then for those of us who maybe haven't experienced anxiety before are experiencing anxiety for the first time. So we're seeing a lot of anxiety and depression from the general population. Um, and then I would say from the people that we're already serving, we're definitely seeing um, an increase overall in the mental health needs in our community. People are isolated. Uh, we're not with each other. Our, co our country was already facing um an epidemic of loneliness and disconnection from each other and even though we're connected even more than ever on social media and virtually people are feeling more and more lonely than ever before um, and the pandemic has only made this worse um, we're also seeing a lot more family stress so we're being put together into our family units without the benefit of the time apart that we have day to day, going to our jobs, going to school or daycares. Um, and people are taking on responsibilities that they didn't really sign up for to be a full-time parent and a full-time employee and um, all living together under one roof. So we are certainly seeing from um, all areas an increase in family stress, family um, conflict and some need for interventions that way. Um, to top it all off, uh, even mental health providers can't see people in person. So we no longer have the benefit of connecting with our clients one-on-one -on -one, um, together, which we know a big part of the mental health treatment is that therapeutic relationship. And it's that individual connection and being able to sit and hold space uh, for each other that can be um, very therapeutic to someone who is struggling with their mental health. Um, so uh, all of our organizations, the organizations that Ginny talked about in MacMap um, and other mental health providers across the country have been moving primarily to telehealth. So same thing that we're seeing with our medical providers is that we're doing a lot more virtual visits. Um, and so from the mental health community standpoint, we had to go through changes in technology at warp speed and all of us have put up um, uh, ability to do more services virtually. And what we're finding is that this isn't just, this isn't really necessarily a bad thing. So while we are missing each other and being in the room together and having to be a little bit more creative about how we can maintain that connection or feeling of connection um, by being separated, at the same time, we're seeing increased access. So in our world, we're always afraid or worried about no-shows. So we're so used to setting appointments and having people come into our clinics. Um, and transportation is always an issue and trying to get people there and they've got a million other things they have to do that day or there's traffic. And so what we're seeing is that virtual visits actually open it up. So our no-show rates have been decreasing. So the good news is that people are accessing their mental health services at a, at a higher rate than they have before. So we're pretty excited about what that could mean for the future, um, perhaps as we come together a little bit more. Um, the other thing that I think is surprising for therapists and people who are used to doing our work in, in an office with people visiting us is that we're getting to see people's home environments. Um, so just that virtual connection, there's so much you can learn about being in someone's home or connecting um, and seeing them live in their home environments as they try to make some time or carve out time for their therapy. And so there is an increased sense of understanding the person in their environment that I don't know that we had as much before um, telehealth. 
And then I'd say, you know, the other thing that we're noticing, which my organization does a lot of hands-on, what we call case management, helping people in their communities get employment, get housing. And we're actually seeing with a little bit of distance and some of this um, uh, services over the phone or over virtual is that there is kind of an increased autonomy that people are feeling sort of this ability to grab um, their opportunities and uh, choices kind of on their own more than maybe they were when we um, were able to do a lot for them in the community. So that's kind of an interesting thing that we're learning too. So that's kind of the overview of how mental health services have adjusted to COVID. Um, we are very worried about what a second wave will mean, what the new life means for everybody and, um, and how this will change our work and have an impact, I think, on the broader community and our own mental well-being. So Janice is going to now talk a little bit about some self-care strategies and ways that people can, can cope. Hello, everyone. A lot of what Julie um, had talked about as far as you know, business and how people are doing is pretty, holding pretty true for us up here as well. We're rural up here. Um, if you don't know that, there's like 32 people per square mile here. So people are isolated without having a pandemic or um, some other concerns going on in the world. And what we have found is that when this first came out that the pandemic really didn't seem to be showing us anything yet, but as time went on, we're seeing now we're getting referrals for kids and families are picking up because those kids have been home with um, no school sites to be going to for the past couple of months. And so we've got families that are starting to get into distress and needing some help. We have um, increased incidence of depression and, and anxiety as well. And what I found um, that needed to be put out on our website, at least for anybody to access, is what are our local resources and where can you find them? And so I did attach some resources to this presentation, but they're pretty much located in our northern part of our county, which I think people needed to know about. We had the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, but people needed access to know what are the screening tools out there? What do I need to do if, something, if, if I have these symptoms? Where can I go? Who can I reach out to? What are, where are our crisis services? Where um, will the mobile crisis team come and see me? There's certain services in our agency that didn't close down. We have um, technically three residential sites. We have a detox, a treatment, uh, 90 day Ertz program, uh, crisis stabilization program and a mobile crisis team. And our mobile crisis team was informed they needed to continue to operate. And so what we have done across all those settings and where I was before I came back here to give you on time was finalizing our COVID-19 preparedness plans at all those locations and we're you know, getting training together for staff. So we know what to do and everybody's on the same page with that to take away some of that anxiety because I think there was a lot of anxiety about people getting sick. We have a lot of staff here who are immune compromised and some who have health conditions that are not conducive for them to be even coming into an office. And so we have altered people's schedules to be able to work remotely as much as possible as long as the waivers that are in place allow us to do that or if they have to come into an office to limit some of that time. And that has taken away some of that anxiety for people out in our workforce who have some um, extenuating circumstances where, where they may be caring also for an elderly person in their home and they don't wanna make anybody else sick either by leaving their home and going into an office and coming back. Um, so we have done all of the safety protocols as far as temping people and, and, and you know following the screening tools. We are not open to uh, services, um, but what I was finding is that at first Zoom was really a great tool. We were using it in, across our sites or for our telehealth pl platform as well as video. However, people were starting to get really lonely and just feeling disconnected, even though they were connecting more in a day, it wasn't in person or in the same place. And so we were having some staff feeling kind of isolated at home or even isolated in their office if that was the case. So a couple things that we did in the meantime is talk about self-care. We would we were meeting at least twice a month by Zoom to do luncheons and we have some kind of trivia that we do as a group or we, we talk about our interests or what our plans are just to connect with people across our settings because we're pretty spread out. We have offices in Ely, Virginia and Hibbing 
and all of the, those locations are um, at least a 30 minute drive or more to get to that site. The other thing that we did is we resurrected our agency kind of in-house newsletter where people can contribute to that and add things. And um, we have what's called a gimme five where people can tell us five things about yourself. So we're getting to know each other more and which I think is really interesting because we don't take the time to, to have those conversations when we're all in the same place and we're seeing people and our schedules are busy. So we're finding out things that we didn't know. We're having um, people put and put into what's working, what's not working. What do you think needs to change to have things either feel more connected or run smoothly? And I think that's been really helpful for managers and administrators. Uh, the focus is family first. So if you have a need or you feel like you're not doing well, you have the ability to either choose to work from home or call in sick. Um, so we make sure people know what the parameters of work are and it's not something that they need to be worried about. We do encourage you know, the wheels of wellness through SAMHSA to make sure that you have balance in your life and that you're able to function and carry out through your day. We have um, opened our policy for people to be accessed if there's a problem that comes up or something that's not working. Because I think the biggest fear that some of our folks have already, especially um, some of our, not just our clients that we serve or people that we serve, but our staff who may have a history of depression, anxiety, or PTSD, those things have now surfaced to the top, especially with um, the increased cases of COVID-19 and now with um, the death of George Floyd and the aftermath of that. There's a uh, a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with what's going on in the world and that can increase their inability to find uh, self-regulation and feel good. So we encourage people to take time during their day to meditate, to um, connect with somebody who they find supportive and to, to always take lunch because I think one of the things that a lot of my staff have learned to do is to just continue to work and not take that time for themselves and to make that okay and to ask for PTO or time off if you feel you really need it and, and that's perfectly fine. We do have, um, you know, we do have the PPE on site and we do temp people and we do um, have all of those safety precautions in place, but we're not used to not seeing each other. And that I think has been the biggest change for all of us is that we feel isolated even though we're connecting more by Zoom. And so what I found was really important is to make sure that all of our staff had the same information about what were the resources in our specific area and what things were helpful if you were not doing well. And we shared those on our website as well as um, found other resources they could access if they needed to. Self-care gets to be really important as stress rises and self-care is different for every person. And so making that personalized to what works for an individual was our focus. And so far we have um, had pretty good success with that. We have had people, you know, say, hey, I'm just not doing well, can I stay home? I'm like, if that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. And we'll, you know, touch base with me when you're able. Um, we don't want everybody, anybody to become overstressed or taxed. And we have, we have a list of people who are clinically on call for our agency who can fill in and not just one person's doing that job. Um, we did see a, we're now starting to see an increase in our calls to our crisis lines and our mobile crisis team has been going out. Um, we thought really long and hard about that and we've only allowed that if they follow the PPE precautions and we have a screening tool in place to ask those symptomology questions and then to record that and to take their temperature and then we discard of all of that when we leave them because we do follow up in the community for folks who don't have any services and we also if last resort go to the ER to assess people so I mean that's pretty much it in a nutshell for us I mean there's obviously more specifics we could get into we do share books we I mean we we talk about what helpful book resources are out there or online resources are out there and we share that throughout our agency well, wonderful thank you so much Jenny Janice and Julie for speaking today we're so happy to to have you um, next, we would like to ask Dr. Beckler to discuss the connection between heart health and mental health. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to the three J's, I realize. 
um, Janice, Jenny, and Julie for uh, being a great setup for exactly what we see true um, uh, from a heart perspective. So um, as you heard, I helped direct our um, Emerging Science Centers, which is our women's heart disparities and our prevention. And prior to this, I ran the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing. And so I'm a real big um, believer scientifically and um, mentally in a whole body approach, a mind, body, and spirit. Uh, next slide, please. So I love this uh, slide because it's old and sometimes we're always looking for new evidence to show things that we, we actually need to look to the past. This was from Hippocrates and many of you know that we take the Hippocratic Oath when we graduate medical school. And as you can see here, you ought not to attempt to cure the body with the soul, the cure to many diseases unknown to physicians because they disregard the whole. And again, I think it just speaks to the need to think of us as one whole human being. Uh, next slide, please. So the interheart study um, was this huge, you know, standardized case control study that was done um, a little bit ago now, but 52 countries, um, nearly every continent with the goal of figuring out was there any risk factors for um, coronary artery disease, so the blockages in the heart that we, that we weren't aware of. And if you go to the next slide, please. You can see here that what the study showed was that 32% of all of our heart disease risk was secondary to psychosocial factors. So again, some of the things that the three J's just talked about, depression, stress, anxiety, anger, social isolation, all of these things um, are really a significant part of, um, of our risk overall. And then we also know that uh, psychological disorders and personality characteristics have been shown to have a negative impact on our cardiac health overall. So there's lots of studies that demonstrate, um, you know, this chicken or egg, which comes first, but that we are at a higher likelihood of having um, worse heart outcomes with ongoing psychological disorders. We know that depression prevalence is three times higher in our cardiac patients. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about why that is and again which comes first and then finally when we looked at um, quality of life and just overall um, emotional distress that our cardiac patients are at a higher risk of developing those next slide please so just what happens um, you know i think that again we look to the past because this is very old this was a study that was actually originally done by william harvey in the 1600s showing that um, what was described as a mental disturbance provoking pain or joy, hope or anxiety extends to the heart where it affects the temper and rate. And again, to me, that gets to what we have since learned about stress. When we experience stress, it increases our sympathetic nervous system, which is known as our fight or flight response, which then increases our blood pressure and increases our heart rate that subsequently leads to an increase in our blood sugar, which then leads to that cascade of an increase in insulin and an increase in inflammation. Next slide here. And so you can see, you know, again, we have this sort of um, prehistoric response or, you know, we're really uh, set so that if we are experiencing a tiger chasing us, we go into that sympathetic nervous system response. We need that, right? But now it's not a tiger. It's traffic on I-94. It's, you know, dealing with the pandemic and the unknown of the future, dealing with, you know, 400 years of racism and the realities of having this come to life here in the Twin Cities. Um, all of these things that are ongoing chronic stressors to our body, um, but different than you know, removing your hand from a hot stove that we need that sympathetic nervous system response. So it's a very different type of chronic stress that we're seeing now. Next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of how real, um, and I think you're probably already all seeing this there, but how real this is, there's actually a syndrome in the heart called broken heart syndrome. And that um, has a few different names. It's stress-induced cardiomyopathy is another way to describe that, or takasubos, um, which was how the Japanese originally um, discovered this because it looked, takasubo is Japanese for octopus in the heart, and it looked like there was an octopus in, in the heart. Well, 
what happens is that people come in after a very stressful event, the death of a loved one, you know, bankruptcy, homelessness, whatever the case might it be, they look in the emergency room as if they're having a heart attack. They have intense chest pain. Their EKG looks just like they're having a heart attack. We rush them up to the catheterization lab to see um, if they are in fact having a heart attack and we find they have normal coronary arteries. Um, it turns out it's more common in people over 50 and in women, but what this is subsequently we found is it's a surge of those catecholamines, those fight or flight hormones, and um, that there is this strong connection between the heart and brain. Um, so much so now that there are studies actively um, looking at how we have traditionally treated this by, you know, repairing the heart as if it's heart failure, and we treat with similar medications like that to help the heart heal, but we find that we also have to repeal, uh, repair the mind in this process, that it's not one or the other, it's the whole piece. So this is a very um, real phenomena, and not only um, do we see it happen once, but occasionally in some folks it happens twice or even beyond that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this was a slide that uh, was put out by the CDC, and I just thought they did a great job of kind of helping us understand this uh, chicken egg phenomena that I've been talking about. So again, um, what we see is that depending on which side that you want to start on of this slide, that um, Anxiety, depression, chronic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, all these things that our three J's mentioned earlier, um, this then can uh, actually create pathways, physiologic pathways, right? So again, this brain-body connection that um, then increases pain, fear, cardiac reactivity, reduces the blood flow of the heart, and ultimately increases cortisol. All of those things are things that we don't want to have happen to the heart. They actually increase the risk of all of these conditions that then bring about the things that we see on the right side, stroke, heart failure, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, coronary artery plaque, and heart attack. Um, but then we know, again, people who have these conditions that maybe didn't start over here with anxiety, depression, or chronic stress, then can be more likely to develop anxiety and depression and chronic stress after having one of these events. So it really can go both ways in that, um, from that perspective. Next slide. So you can see here that we know that heart conditions that are impacted by poor mental health include um, high blood pressure, our heart rate variability. So um, again, we want our heart to be able to go up and down real quickly. That's a sign of good health, but um, that can actually decrease, that variability can decrease with poor mental health. Cholesterol, we know, is increased, coronary artery blockages, congestive heart failure, and then all the behaviors, right, obesity, nutrition, physical activity. I would argue that, um, you know, if, if we're struggling with our mental health, it's very difficult to work on losing weight, eating well, um, and exercising. That Again, we know that if we can do those things, they can also improve our mental health, but it's it's difficult to sometimes be able to start um, from that perspective. Next slide, please. So I just, um, as others were talking about, I just wanna emphasize that um, there's lots of research to show some of the coping mechanisms that, um, I'm sorry that I keep referring to you guys as a three J's, but it's just easiest for me we're um, referring to, but this was a trial um, that was done in the 90s by Dean Ornish, a cardiologist at Harvard, who basically showed that intensive lifestyle changes, so a healthy diet, which in this case was mainly plant-based, um, exercise, stress management, smoking cessation, and group psychosocial support actually reduced the blockages in the arteries. It is the only um, trial that's ever been done, done that's shown reversal of heart disease. And it's actually a program that is now covered by Medicare in that way. And there's all sorts of studies to show that meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, exercise, guided imagery, all of these wonderful things that help our body calm actually reverse um, and decrease our risk of heart disease. Um, next slide. 
So I just wanted to include a couple for your own reference. This was one that was done with um, transcendental meditation, which again is sort of the um, most uh, extreme or in, uh, the most well studied type of meditation. But you can see here, I think specifically related to the recent um, George Floyd murder that not only are these effective um, for the population overall, but we see a very big improvement in our um, minority uh, communities that are most impacted by racial disparities. So again, here there was a 48% risk reduction of mortality, uh, heart attack and stroke in our African American patients who did transcendental meditation. So quite a big impact. You know, if we could do that with a drug, that would be something we would try to require all med patients to take. So this shows you all the natural options. Um, and then I think I have one more slide and then I will pass it over. Um, oh, well, I guess it goes on to Dr. Park, but just, um, just would emphasize, again, I think just the reality that our brain and heart health are very interconnected and the opportunity to do lots of prevention and mitigation along the way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckler. It's a pleasure to have you as well. Um, next, we have Dr. Park, who will discuss the role that sleep can play in our mental health and overall health. Once again, I want to thank all the, the panelists and the members so far. This has been uh, very educational for me as well. But I think the way, I guess, uh, as I deal with both uh, critical care patients in our uh, ICU as well as sleep medicine, obviously, sleep kind of actually encompasses all of the things that was talked about and both sleeping well will improve some of those factors as and Dr. Beckler and others have kind of talked about the importance of, of mindfulness and these, but it turns out um, all of improving all of those things can also help sleep um, um, get better quality sleep. So it turns out there's a very kind of bi-directional interdependence between those. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. I think one of the important things to kind of set up our foundation is the expectation. What do we think is the expected or uh, the considered the normative value for how much sleep we should be getting? And as is um, commonly experienced and often kind of talked about, as we age, we probably need to sleep a little less than when we're certainly in our infancy and in our um, in newborn stages. But what this graph also represents is that, is that there's a range. There's a range of what's kind of what every individual needs. And so there are individuals who actually will do perfectly fine on five, six hours of sleep. Their mental acuity, their mood, health, all of those are perfectly uh, normal and, do, and they do well. Whereas there are individuals who need up to nine, maybe 10 hours of sleep to be able to function normally. And the reason I mention that is it's important to recognize the individual needs of how much sleep we all need. And sometimes I find that that sometimes causes a little bit of friction between the spouses. When one spouse gets up after six hours, it's like, oh, is this normal? This is abnormal. Can you keep it quiet? Because I need to sleep nine hours. And so there's a little bit of attention, but still I think, again, in, in, the, in the ideal of kind of, uh, of, of understanding that every one of us have different needs. At the same time, trying to force yourself to, to sleep too long could actually be detrimental, and we'll talk about a little bit about that. So again, I just want to emphasize that there are different individual needs, but on average, most of us probably need about seven, seven and a half hours of sleep on a regular basis. Let me go to the next slide. And so unfortunately, when it comes to sleep and the negative impact that, that, that comes with not sleeping enough um, is mostly on, done on uh, sleep deprivation studies. There aren't a lot of studies that look specifically at sleep quality, so the, the negative impact of poor sleep quality. And I think a lot of the literature will kind of extrapolate the idea of not sleeping enough with that of not uh, getting uh, good quality sleep. So partial sleep deprivation is that there's consistently you're getting less than ideal amounts of sleep, whatever that might be for you. There have been uh, certainly these unfortunate rigorous studies that we do total sleep deprivation. So we have them not sleep for three days straight and we can do these various measurements of things. And that it turns out those kind of extreme sleep deprivation studies, the findings of those are much more dramatic than these partial sleep deprivations. But what's also recognized is that about a third of us just get consistently less than six hours of sleep. And I bring this graph here, uh, this little um, cartoon that we actually develop what's called sleep debt. So if your body needs seven hours of sleep every day, but for various pressures, you're only getting say six hours. So you're one hour short every day. You actually develop one hour sleep debt every day. So at the end of the week, it's as if you 
missed a full day of sleep. So you actually accumulate the sleep debt. And unfortunately, that's I think where many of us are suffering the consequences of that. Can we go to the next slide? And so what are the consequences of sleep deprivation? So if you go ahead and click. So what we find is that the multitude of issues that come with not sleeping well um, are, again, again, most of these studies were done on, on, on sleep deprivation. But I think, again, as we think about what happens if we don't sleep well, there are multiple studies. And again, um, looking at different range of large studies and cellular-based studies, all these things. And a couple of things that's related to kind of our topic here um, in terms of the current pandemic, in terms of our immune response. So there are several studies looking at the effect of sleeping well after we get some kind of a vaccination and our body's response in developing the appropriate response to that, the antibody a certain cell population, that if you don't sleep well, that that function is reduced. We also find that there are certain cells in our body that fight infection, that those functions can also be decreased. And then obviously there's what, it's interesting about sleep and, um, is that the amount of sleep and our risk of dying is what we call a kind of a U-shaped distribution. So if you don't sleep enough, turns out your risk of dying is high. But the flip side is if you're spending too much time in bed sleeping, that risk of death also turns to, turns out that's increased. As with all of these things, it's not to say that sleep is the cause of this, I, that there's a lot of things that influences this, as Dr. Beck, uh, Becker talked about, there's cardiovascular disease, this imp increased sympathetic activity, that if we don't sleep well, we've, all these measurements show that these are increased. And so it's not to say that sleep deprivation alone causes these things, but that the, some of these things are associated, like obesity, that if you aren't sleeping, if you don't sleep well, if you're sleep deprived, our, our body's response to things like insulin and various hormones that help us feel full all of those things are uh, affected. And so that then subsequently can lead to obesity. So there are lots of consequences of sleep deprivation. Um, if we go to the next slide. So, so um, where we are with this obviously is the things that we're finding, the stress of not only the pandemic and the social unrest, that obviously lots of folks are very worried about that. But what's also we find is that because of the issue of, of being at home and working at home and not going out and being in this isolation, that our sleep schedule and certainly our day routine becomes so random that that turns out can also negatively impact our sleep. So not only are you lying in bed worrying about what's going to happen to you, either your loved ones or yourself or whatever it might be, obviously if you're furloughed. The, so all of these financial and all these concerns certainly affect our ability to kind of get some rest but also the irregular schedules, probably the lack of physical activity, all these things. So uh, again, then the in impact of that, that again, Dr. Bechler and others have kind of talked about. So in the last few minutes, I kind of want to spend a little time on, on things that I think would be helpful to improve your sleep in, in, in the midst of this pandemic, but it's just some, and some general advice in general, if you click. So again, as I mentioned, I think it's important to establish some kind of a regular routine. It's very easy to not do that just because of, Various, you know, well, I could, I, my meeting's not until 11, I'm just going to get up at 10. Um, since I'm going to, since I don't need to get up early tonight, I'm just going to go to bed at two o'clock in the morning, whatever it might be. I think it's still important, even though you might not have to get up to go to work and drive to work and all of those things, I think it's still very important that you try to establish some kind of a regular routine. Again, as was kind of mentioned earlier, physical activity. We know that maintaining physical activity is not only important for your heart health, if we find that it's also very important for your brain health, but it's also turns out important for sleep. There's a study done looking specifically, for example, at a group of uh, folks. So this particular study looked at postmenopausal women and looked at their sleep quality between their inactivity, doing passive exercise type things like yogas and stretches, and then aerobic activities. And turns out that those who are doing aerobic activity, their sleep quality as you measure by different stages of sleep and amount of that deep sleep, which is the restorative sleep, that that actually increases with physical activity. As you can imagine, if you're just not doing much during the day, not expending a lot of energy or um, uh, 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 activity, that it's much, e you don't feel as tired. And so it's very easy that your schedule can be very disrupted. So I would encourage maintaining some kind of a physical activity, whether you're working out at home through some YouTube videos or just you know, stretching or whatever it is, we find that that's actually very important. 
as I mentioned earlier, this spending time in bed, again, because we have this laxity of schedule, we find it it's easy to just to go to bed early and, and wake up late and whatever it is. But what we find when you do that is that it actually affects your sleep quality. Again, the other thing that we find is that, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, I'm gonna to try to go to bed earlier and spend more time in bed. And it turns out doing that consistently can affect your sleep quality. So earlier we talked about the importance of getting enough, enough sleep, so sleep quantity, but it turns out the sleep quality is also important. So if you'll pardon the analogy, what I often kind of think about our sleep is, if you'd imagine this river flowing down the mountain, so again, sorry for those, um, but I'm a visual kind of a guy. So if you can imagine a river flowing down the, down the mountain, if it has a certain amount of, because it's the same amount of water, if that riverbed widens, that river then has to be shallow. Whereas if it's a, it's a narrower river, it has to be a deeper river because it's the same amount of water that flows down the mountain. Likewise, if we spend our sleep requirement over too long a period, like that shallow river, you're not getting that deep sleep, which is the restorative sleep. And so by confining and getting closer to what your body actually needs, you get more of that deep sleep, which is the more restorative sleep, and turns out that's a more healthier sleep. So you're really trying to avoid, just because you didn't sleep well, saying I'm gonna spend an extra two, three hours in bed, turns out that's actually the wrong move. And you really wanna to try to, even though you didn't sleep well, you'll, you still wanna to try to keep fairly consistent with what your sleep requirements are, whether it's seven and a half, eight hours, whatever that might be, because then you're most likely that particular night, you'll probably get increased slow wave sleep or deep sleep and dream sleep that you're catching up on the night before. So again, try to avoid that. The next slide. Again, we, meant, we talk about this to a lot of our um, teenagers and, and now with the growing population, avoid electronics for a couple of reasons. One. It turns out for many of us, even that life from our electronic device can actually affect our uh, certain uh, uh, hormone in our brain called melatonin and various light receptors that actually can delay our sleep onset even more. But also with all the news and bad things that's happening, I think it also feeds into our worries and anxiety and fear and all of these things. And so I really discourage avoiding, uh, trying to avoid any kind of electronics. But those people who say, well, I'm gonna read, I, that's, that's the only way I can fall asleep. Ideally then, if you have to use electronics, again, go to the night setting mode, dim the lights or something so that you're not getting as, as much intensity. And I usually recommend doing that before you go to bed and only go to bed and use the bed primarily for intimacy and sleep only. Don't watch TV in bed, don't read in bed, these type of things. So that over time, as you maintain that consistency, when you go to bed, you're ready to sleep. If you click on the next one, again, much easier said than done, right? Like with all of these things that's happening, and, um, and again, many of our therapists will, will resonate with this, but it's easy to do, but this is where I, what I encourage folks to do, again, is maybe set aside a little thinking time before you actually go to bed. Kind of if you're worried about tomorrow, if you're plan whatever it is, if you're a planner, I would encourage you to think about, well, what do I do about this tomorrow? Not how do I solve this problem, but what do I do about this tomorrow? And hopefully by thinking about kind of more concrete steps of I'm worried about my loved one. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll call them and see how they're doing, right? So something a little more concrete so that you're not kind of spinning the wheel. And hopefully if you have a little bit more kind of a closure or an idea what to do next, you'll stop worrying about that so much in bed. Again, like many things, I think it'll take practice, but obviously um, that's important. And then the last thing, we know that there are many things, medications, certain disorders, these things that can affect sleep. And some people just have this physiologic insomnia that we need to help them work through that. And so again, certainly talking with your provider would be important. And then the last thing, I just get a couple of resources. Um, the next slide. So Sleep Foundation has great resources and some of the content that I've talked about in terms of the effect of uh, poor sleep and, and diabetes and, and all those things. But the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is a second reference, that's kind of one of our professional sleep uh, focus organization. They actually have great uh, resources for patients. And so again, you can click on those type of things. So, so what I hope to emphasize was again, um, sleep is certainly an important and integral part of our overall health and sleeping well could hopefully help with our mind resilience. And again, because that bi-directional relationship, if you don't sleep well, you feel more depressed. And so hopefully by sleeping well, that can help some of that um, and help kind of on the road to helping with some, a lot of these things that was discussed earlier. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, now it is time to transition into our Q&A. Um, we're going to pull up a few questions and um, any of our panelists, please feel free to unmute yourself to share any thoughts that you may have. 
So one question that we have submitted is, what are the biggest rumors or stigmas regarding mental health during the COVID crisis? Oh, this is Jan. Have... I think that one of the biggest misnomers is that um, mental health doesn't change and that people might need more support versus less support and they might look like they're doing okay when they might not be doing okay and just making sure they have access to resources and that um, we actually posted something on our website early on saying, hey, we're here. Here's how you get a hold of us. Here's some resources you can call independently, let us know how you're doing. Um, we're here for you. Thank you. Anyone else want to share anything? And if, and if not, we can jump to the next one because it kind of piggybacks off of that. What, what are some suggested resources that someone can share with their um, employees? That's a great question. So I would say kind of jumping off of what Janice just said is that the it's not perfect. So um, some people are saying, oh, you're at, you're at home, you can do all this like self enlightening work and learn a new, you know, a new um, musical instrument and do all of these things. And, and really sometimes it's just like Ginny said in the beginning, it's okay to not be okay. And progress is not linear. You may one day be feeling great and another be feeling really down and that's okay. Um, so I'd say with my staff, um, for resources, um, SAMHSA is a great resource at the national level. It's the, um, oh, it's an ac acronym, <laughs> um, but it's, it's on mental health and substance abuse. Um, but in general, there's just a lot of really great resources right now um, regarding mental health. And, um, and I'd say those articles that really kind of make it okay to um, slow down, you know, that you don't always have to be super productive um, during COVID right now, we're just, just our brains are so overloaded just by all of the shifts and changes that are happening that you don't have to be perfect in any way, shape or form. So I think um, I've been sharing a lot of resources um, in, Min in Minnesota, there's a call to mind series with um, through American Public Media and NPR. And they've been doing a lot of really fantastic connecting to resources and they've had some really great um, presentations and shows on, on this topic. And those are really great for employees and staff. So I would, I would recommend looking in um, to that resource and then just you know following different mental health organizations online. The National Alliance on Mental Illness is another really great one. Um, or NAMI Minnesota for short. Um, they share a lot of great resources too. Thank you so much, Julie. Let's move on to another question. Um, what is a good way to help you sleep at night if you already take melatonin and still have trouble staying asleep? Mr. Park, that might be um, your, your avenue. I think I'll try that one. I'll take that one. So, um, so yes, yeah, so melatonin. What I find is that um, melatonin as a general sleep aid is okay. What probably works best, um, so if we're trying to kind of follow our biological rhythm, so melatonin, um, is uh, our brain produces it and it has that kind of what we call circadian rhythm release. What we find in regards to melatonin is that in our body it actually peaks and on its as it descend is when we'll actually fall asleep and after it troughs when as it starts to rise is when we wake up. Where I think most people miss, uh, kind of don't take it correctly uh, to, to its, for its full effect, if you're going to follow that biological rhythm you should actually not take it just before you go to bed because it takes a little while for your body to absorb in that level to peak. And then by the time it's starting to drop, it may be an hour, two, or even three hours later. Where we find that melatonin works really well is again in enhancing your own circadian rhythm. And so this is where, for those who are taking melatonin, this is where a conversation with your physician might be important to recognize, is it possible that you actually have what we call a delayed sleep phase syndrome, where your biological clock says, I'm not ready to sleep until two o'clock, but boy, I have to get up at six, I have to go to bed at 10. But that's like asking someone who typically goes to bed at 10, say, okay, it's at six o'clock, go to bed. And you can imagine how dyssynchronous that could be. So this is where for most people, if you find that, for some people, they take melatonin right before the bed and go, oh, this is great. For other people, uh, for, uh, 
what I might suggest is try taking it earlier, maybe an hour, maybe even two hours before your ideal bedtime. Again, still be careful because some people will get a little drowsy. So don't take and go, oh, I got to go shopping, right? Don't, don't do any of those things. But take it about an hour or two before you go to bed and then see if that can kind of help you with sleep. But again, melatonin is probably helpful mostly to help you get to sleep. If you're waking up in the middle of the night, again, that might re require some conversation with your provider to try to understand what is it that's waking you up and keeping you awake. Hope that helps Wonderful. answer some of that. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Park. Well, um, panelists, do you have any final thoughts that you might want to throw out there for our attendees today? All right, well, wonderful. Um, everyone, that is going to conclude today's webinar. Um, again, my name is Caitlin Bloomquist, and on behalf of everyone at Green Spring Media and Minnesota Monthly Magazine, uh, we want to thank our medical community for their time, their service, their sacrifice. And in our September October issue, um, we are honoring these healthcare heroes in our Top Doctors issue, which is highlighting and celebrating the best medical professionals um, across the state of Minnesota. And if you'd like to learn more um, about the issue or anything about Minnesota Monthly and what we do here, um, please feel free to contact me. And of course, thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much to our attendees. And thank you again to Mayo Clinic for sponsoring this community conversation on mental health and well-being. And one last time, um, we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording of the presentation and links to resources. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.